started. <laughs> okay, I guess we'll get started. Um, so I think everybody in the room knows me. I'm doing Critical Care Journal Club today. So the outline, um, as you can gather from it, we're going to be talking about delirium in the ICU a little bit from this outline. Unfortunately, I have no disclosures. So this is the article that I'm going to be presenting. It was just published in JAMA in March of this year called The Effect of Dexmedetomidine Added to Standard Care on Ventilator Free Time in Patients with Agitated Delirium, a randomized control trial. So before we get into the article, just going into a little bit of background. So what is delirium? So the uh, psychiatrists have their DSM book, and the most recent one, this is their definition. There are five key features to diagnose delirium. Disturbance in attention and awareness, which develops over a short period of time, usually hours to days. It is a change from the patient's baseline and often fluctuates throughout the day. There's usually an additional disturbance in cognition, whether it's memory or speech or language. It's not better explained by another pre-existing or established neurocognitive disorder. And um, there is evidence either by labs or history and physical that the disturbance is caused by a medical condition, um, intoxication or withdrawal or medication side effect. The things that we often also see are psychomotor disturbances like hypo or hyperactivity, sleep disturbances, emotional disturbances, all these things I'm sure everybody has seen at some point in the ICU. So why do we care about delirium? It can affect up to 30% of older medical patients at some time during their hospitalization. And there have been many studies out there where the rates are variable reported in the ICU, but it can be as common as up to 70% of our ICU patients when we use our standardized screening and diagnostic tools to make the diagnosis. And why is it important? There have been many studies that were published that show that it is a prognostic determinant of a hospital outcomes, including patients going into the nursing home for the first time, functional decline, long-term cognitive impairment, which we all know about, and possibly death. So this is a nice table pulled out of up-to-date that kind of goes over common causes of delirium in confusional states. Um, so anytime we have a patient that we're thinking about delirium, the first thing we typically do is look at the med rec to see is there anything that we're giving to the patient that is causing, causing this disturbance. But patients who are withdrawing or using substances can also be affected. All of our septic patients are at risk. Patients with metabolic derangements, severe electrolyte abnormalities, um, patients who are having seizures, traumatic brain injuries or head injuries, multi-system organ failure going along with our sepsis, and then physical disorders like hyperhypothermia, patients who come in with severe trauma or burns, all are at risk for developing delirium at some point in their hospital stay. So how do we diagnose delirium? There are a few instruments that have been validated. So the CAM ICU, I believe, is the one that we use here in our system. It has been validated at Yale in a prospective study um, for delirium in the ICU. And when used appropriately, it has a pretty high sensitivity <coughs> and specificity. The other one that is available that we do not use here is the intensive care delirium check list for screening. It's also been uh, validated in the diagnosis of delirium in the ICU setting and actually shows high agreement rates with the CAM ICU. So either one is appropriate. So this is the CAM ICU um, screening tool which we use here. Our nurses are triggered to do this. Um, so the presence of feature one and two plus either three or four confirms the diagnosis of delirium. So Typically, the nurse will be pretty astute about letting us know that the patient has been fluctuating or more disorganized or seems to be more altered than usual. This is an example of the um, intensive care delirium screening checklist, the one that we do not use here. It has a few more points to it, but it pretty much mimics the ICU cam. It's just a little bit longer. It takes into account the sedation score, um, disorientation, hallucinations, psychomotor agitation, inappropriate speech, and the fluctuation of symptoms. So a score of four has a 99% sensitivity correlation for the diagnosis of delirium. And then just to remind, because they use the SAS score here for sedation, this is what we're looking at. So the goal is to have patients calm and cooperative, but obviously there's a broad scale of how patients can present. So now moving on to um, what we're going to talk about in this study. So dexmedetomidine, otherwise known as Presidex. This is an alpha-2 adenoreceptor agonist. 
It has both anesthetic and sedative properties, thought to be due to activation of the G proteins um, on, on the receptors in the brain stem, causing inhibition of norepi release. It also has peripheral um, receptor activation at high doses and rapid administration, which causes vasoconstriction. <coughs> this is a pretty rapid onset of action within five to 10 minutes with the IV bolus and takes effect pretty quickly as well within 15 to 30 minutes. The duration is dose dependent, but anywhere from one to two hours. There are multiple adverse effects that were listed, but the one that I um, wanna focus on is the one that we tend to see the most, which are the hemodynamic side effects with hypotension and bradycardia, which can happen in up to at least 10% of patients who are being treated. <coughs> Monitoring um, with patients on Presidex, you look at their level of sedation, heart rate, rhythm, respirations, and blood pressure. Um, for critically ill, mechanically vented patients, we'll typically be using our sedation scores that I showed on the previous slide. Um, and just of note, it can cause minimal respiratory depression, increase, uh, inhibit salivation, and it is analgesic sparing. So this is a nice schematic of um, where Presidex acts. So clearly when we're using it, it does act in the brain at the locus ceruleus and the brain stem for sedation. Um, but you can see for the hemodynamic side effects where it acts in the periphery causing vasodilation or um, blocking the cardio accelerator nerve causing tachycardia, but it also works in the spinal cord causing some analgesia as well. So multiple effects, some, most of them positive, I guess. So Prestidex is not new and it's been studied a lot over the last several years. JAMA seems to like to um, publish all the articles about Presidex, including the one I'm going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. And um, when Katie gave her presentation earlier this year about sedation in the ICU, she did touch on delirium and mention these studies, so they may sound familiar to some of you. So the first mm -hmm. trial um, that was uh, printed in JAMA in 2007 was the MENS trial, and that was a double-blinded randomized control trial of 106 mechanically vented ICU patients at two tertiary centers um, from 2004 to 2006. And the main outcomes that they were looking at were days alive without delirium or coma and percentage of days spent within one ROS point of the sedation goal. So what they came up with in this study is that the use of Presidex resulted in more days alive without delirium or coma and more time at the targeted level of sedation compared to lorazepam, which was thought to be the standard of care. <coughs> the next trial that they published in 2009 was the SEDCOM trial. And this trial was looking at the efficacy and safety of prolonged sedation with Presidex versus midazolam for mechanically vented patients. And it was also a prospective double-blind randomized trial in 68 centers in five countries um, in ICUs um, from 2005 to 2007. So the m outcomes that they were looking at when this one was the percentage of time within the target ROS range and then the secondary endpoints were prevalence and duration of delirium, use of fentanyl and open label midazolam and nursing assessments. And also duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU length of stay and adverse events. So what they saw in this study was that there was no difference between Presidex and midazolam in time at the, for the targeted sedation level in vented patients. And when patients were adequately or comparably sedated, Presidex patients spent less time on the ventilator, had less delirium, and developed less tachycardia and hypertension. And then the final study in uh, JAMA in 2012 were the PRODEX and MIDEX trials. And uh, this was a two-phase, multi-center, randomized, double-blind trial from 2007 to 2010. So the MIDEX trial um, compared midazolam with Presidex in the ICUs at European, um, nine European countries. And the PRODEX trial um, compared propofol versus um, Presidex in 31 centers in six European countries and also in Russia. So the main outcomes, they were looking to see if Presidex was non-inferior to the control with respect to um, a proportion of time at targeted sedation level. And then secondary endpoints were looking at the patient's ability to communicate pain, um, using visual analog scales and also ICU length of stay. So what they came up with with these trials was that Presidex was not inferior to midazolam and propofol in maintaining light to moderate sedation and that Presidex reduced duration of mechanical ventilation compared with midazolam and improved patient's ability to communicate pain compared with the other medications. So as you can kind of gather the theme of this, they were looking more at Presidex for sedation um, and then the other endpoints that we were finding were kind of secondary endpoints. 
So now we'll move into the study I'm going to talk about. Um, it's called the effect of dexmedetomidine added to standard care on ventilator-free time in patients with agitated delirium, a randomized control trial. So this is the DALIA study. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, parallel group randomized clinical trial. Yes? Um, you mentioned a couple of outcomes. Uh-huh. Yes, I'm sorry. I highlighted it and I didn't say it and I didn't write it, but I did highlight <coughs> it here. I apologize. Yes, it did. It was um, associated with more side effects. You are correct. Um, so coming back to the study we're talking about today, so this was just published in JAMA in March, so this is about the DALIA study, which was looking at dexmedetomidine to lessen ICU agitation. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, parallel group, randomized clinical trial. Um, they enrolled 74 patients in whom extubation was considered inappropriate because of the severity of agitation and delirium. And this occurred over 15 intensive care units in Australia and New Zealand from 2011 to 2013 and they were mixed medical and surgical units. So intubated ICU patients were randomly allocated to receive either Presidex or saline as the treatment for agitated delirium. As I mentioned, mixed medical and surgical units, uh, patients in these units were all included. Um, all adults 18, ye age 18 years old and older were eligible if their treating physician thought that the only, the major reason that they continued to require mechanical ventilation was because of the degree of agitation. Um, so bad that um, decreasing their sedation would be, make extubation unsafe. So the way that they decided that these patients were so agitated was whether they needed restraints, antipsychotic or sedative medications or both had ICU CAM results consistent with delirium, or had a MOS over five um, consistent with psychomotor agitation. So they did exclude some patients, any pregnancy or breastfeeding, anybody with already um, known dementia or traumatic head injury, because we know that these patients are at higher risk for developing delirium, just with their baseline um, underlying disease. Patients who were already receiving the Presidex or clonidine for sedation, and anybody who had obviously any contraindication to certain medications. Um, there were unblinded pharmacists and nurses who were not carrying, caring, excuse me, for the study patients who prepared the study drugs and the placebo drug in identically labeled syringes. So this is just a couple of schematics. The one on the left, they actually screened a lot of patients, 21,000, and only ended up enrolling 74. Um, not entirely clear. Um, so 41 were randomized to the Presidex arm and 33 were randomized to the placebo arm. Um, after a few patients were withdrew and somebody was randomized incorrectly, they ended up with 39 in the um, treatment arm with Presidex and then 32 in the uh, placebo arm. And then on the left, we have a table of the baseline patient characteristics. So just so we can see compared to <laughs> maybe our patients in the ICU. Um, at least half of them, or majority of them were male. They were in their mid-50s, so maybe not as comparable to I our ICUs. Their Apache scores were relatively low, um, between 10 to 14, indicating a lower overall mortality rate. Um, a good chunk of them actually, more, uh, more than 50% were actually operative patients. And um, you can see on the bottom that at least a third of the patients were requiring restraints prior to enrollment in the study, and a uh, majority of patients, almost all the patients were requiring some sort of sedative or sedation medication prior to enrollment. Um, the big difference that's seen here is that the patients in the Presidex arm were actually, actually, the very bottom one, were intubated longer prior to enrollment compared to the placebo arm, which we'll talk about a little bit later. <coughs> So um, both of the groups, so the initial treatment <coughs> dose was 0.5 mics per kg per hour. Titration was done by the bedside nurse from 0 to 1.5 mics per kg to achieve a ROS of 0, <coughs> which is alert but calm, or, or the physician prescribed goals if it was different. <coughs> um, and the same was for the placebo group. It was an identically labeled infusion, but <coughs> just of saline. So after 48 hours of the study drug infusion, the treating physician could prescribe open-label Presidex 
if they felt that it was necessary for the patient, in which case the study drug was stopped. And then if the study drug was continued for seven days, then it was considered to be a treatment failure, at which point Presidex was initiated. So the goals, their primary outcome um, with this study was looking at the number of ventilator-free hours during ICU admission, and then secondary outcomes, there were 21, which again, I will get to on another slide. So moving on to the results, so for their primary outcome, there was a statistically significant increase in the median ventilator-free hours at seven days in the Presidex group versus the placebo group. So 144 vent-free hours, which is almost six days compared to 127 hours in the placebo group, which is just about five days. And it was a statistically significant p-value. For the 21 secondary outcomes, I'm just highlighting the three that were significant and that were favoring Presidex. Um, and I'll show you the table on the next page. So the, the three that favored the Presidex group were um, the reduced median hours until the bedside nurse thought that the patient was ready for extubation within 19 hours for the Presidex group versus nearly two days in the other group. Um, reduced median time to extubation, which was similar to the, the previous numbers. And accelerated median time to resolution of delirium, which again is almost a day difference. Patients in the placebo group <coughs> did receive significantly more antipsychotics, 65% versus 36%, more opioids, and significantly higher doses of propofol for the seven days after randomization. The Presidex group was associated with a non-significant decrease in ICU length of stay, again by an entire day, and hospital length of stay, again by an entire day. And there were no significant difference in adverse events. So this is the table of all of the secondary outcomes. So I just highlighted the ones that were statistically significant. Again, our primary outcome um, showing the time ventilator free, um, which was higher in the Presidex group, and then the three that favored Presidex in the secondary outcomes, which I had mentioned on the previous slide. And I'm just pointing out that although they weren't statistically significant, we're always looking at ICU length of stay and overall hospital <coughs> length of stay, and it was less in the Presidex group. So this is the Kaplan-Meier curve um, showing the proportion of patients who remained intubated during the first seven days of the study. And as you can see, um, the Presidex group quickly dropped off. The other one did as well, but the Presidex group quickly dropped off in terms of how many patients were remaining intubated after initiation of the mm -hmm. study drug. Okay, so moving on to our discussion. So Dexmedetomidine did increase the number of ventilator-free hours during seven days following randomization, which was the primary outcome that they were looking at. Comparing to placebo, Presidex did hasten the resolution of delirium and extubation in the patients by approximately one day, which is pretty significant. The adverse events were rare and not very different between the two groups. And this is consistent with the previous studies that I had mentioned with the men's trial and the Midex and um, the Prodex where they, they did show that um, Presidex was associated with less delirium in the ICU. And uh, Presidex was also <coughs> found to have a propofol and fentanyl sparing effects quickly within the first day. So there was a, um, a editorial um, printed one month later with Dr. Wesley and this is kind of our assessment collectively of the strengths and weaknesses of this study. So the strengths, it's a randomized controlled trial, multi-center, there's a patient-centered primary endpoint, and again, talking about the length of stay can show some cost-benefit implications, although they weren't statistically significant. Um, the physicians and nurses that were taking care of the patients were blinded to the group allocation, and the study drugs that were prepared uh, were prepared by people who were not involved dir with direct patient care. So limitations, so there are a decent amount of them. So this study was underpowered. As you saw on the enrollment slide, 21,000 patients were screened and identified as potentially um, being able to participate in this study, and they only ended up with 74 of the plan 96 to make it a powerful study. And the only thing that I saw was that it was due to slow enrollment and spent funding, whatever that means, the spent funding. Um, so the study is underpowered from the original plan. Um, the details of the choice of the sedatives and opioids are supplied for the 24 hours prior to randomization, but we don't know the details about the dosages that they were that had been received. So we don't know if they were requiring much more prior to the, the groups that didn't do as well and took longer to come off the ventilator or not. Um, 
In the study itself, the authors actually say that the lack of physician equipoise is considered a strength. I don't know if that's the case. Um, it may be a weakness of the study because we just don't know. It's hard to say, I guess, at this point. And um, the other thing which I had pointed out earlier is that the patients in the Presidex group were vented for a longer period of time prior to enrollment for almost an entire day, 20 hours more so. So maybe that indicates that these patients were sicker prior to enrollment. Um, it, it's, it's hard to say exactly um, how that impacts the overall results of this study. And the MOS score was used as a component for diagnosing the delirium, but further data was not collected um, as part of the criteria to determine resolution of the delirium. The, the study only mentions that it was based on kind of clinical assessment by the physician, taking into account nursing assessments, so, but it doesn't clarify whether or not they were using the standardized tools um, to, acute or to appropriately say that the patient was still delirious or not. So conclusions between myself and Dr. Wesley. <laughs> um, it's an underpowered study, but it is a well-done, double-blinded, randomized control trial. It is showing potential benefits of Presidex. Um, use in addition to standard care for vented patients with agitated delirium who are otherwise ready for extubation. Some of the benefits that they mention is there is a modest reduction in time to liberate from the vent, more rapid resolution of delirium, and sedation and opioid sparing effects. So this is clearly not over. Presidex is obviously um, being looked at continuing. So there um, are ongoing trials right now. The MENS2 trial is currently in uh, recruitment at Vanderbilt and it's called the Maximizing the Efficacy of Sedation and Reducing Neurological Dysfunction and Mortality in Septic Patients with Acute Respiratory Failure. So they're trying to see what is the best sedative medication, and they're looking at um, dexmedetomidine versus propofol to reduce delirium and improve survival and long-term brain function in the vented septic patient, so very specific to what we see here. Um, and then the SPICE-3 trial, which is also um, a multi-center randomized control trial of early goal-directed sedation compared with standard care in mechanically vented patients in the ICU. So the early goal-directed sedation is going to be Presidex with minimization of benzos compared to standard care sedation, which is up to the clinician's discretion, but the plan is to avoid Presidex except for agitation. And they're looking to see if it reduces 90-day mortality in critically ill patients who are expected to require mechanical ventilation for longer than 24 hours. So ultimately, I guess from this study, it is showing some benefit. Overall, I guess um, Presidex is getting cheaper, so maybe it is thought to be an option for us in our patients who, other than agitation and delirium, would otherwise be extubated. That was kind of quick. <laughs> Any questions? Of course you did. <laughs> did they mention uh, the, the protocol says they started at 45? Mm -hmm. And uh, did, the pro did, did they say, did, they, did the article uh, mention the, they tried to look for it, but, mm -hmm. but, but I could find it. Exactly, you know, I, I might have missed it too, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so the, how, how fast did they get to the dose? And what is that dose for if they're patient, they could um, so they could go there it's here so there's titration by the nurse to achieve a ROS of zero and they could go between zero to 1.5 mics but for continue you mean like what time frame yeah it's like I didn't see that specified either so I don't I, I was thinking here you know you need to institute dexatomy in, in six hours you control delirium mm -hmm. And if the enrollment says that what's preventing them from extubation is delirium, mm -hmm. why was the difference only in 20 hours or 21 hours? Yep, almost and the entire day, yeah, And on. then my, the thing I was thinking too, and maybe let me go on and on it, is, is this statistical significance <coughs> translate to a clinical significance? Is, is 20 hours that? That you know that important because the IC event to stay was in pain. Well, I think it's important, but I, I think there are several questions um, for me. So, in looking specifically at the trial that you presented, I don't think that I'm not sure that you presented the most important 
negatives about the trial for me. Okay. Which is that it's time to study yeah. by something that's making this right. up. And so I, I think there's a source of bias. Sure. Because it's really fairly important for us to consider. I think 20 hours is a lot. I also think that when you're talking about these drugs, for me, you really have to consider precisely what the question is that you're trying to answer. If you look at how these studies in terms of those questions. Mm -hmm. You have several studies listed in the preliminary as well as in the follow-up where the studies are really talking about what's the best sedative to use in a ventilator patient. Mm -hmm. And that's one question. If you've got something on a ventilator, is it better to use it end of day is it better to use pressed X, is it better to use protocol? What are the long-term outcomes? What's the role? What's the long-term risk? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's one kind of a question. Mm -hmm. The study that you presented is trying is, is is looking at a question that I think is really important, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit different from those other questions. Right. The question that this is looking at is how do you take care of the variant or agitation in somebody who you're trying to liberate from the dental? Mm -hmm. And that's a different question. That's not the same. Thing. <coughs> right. And it's a very important question, especially here, because we have a lot of patients who are hot after the urine and the amputation. And the question that I would like to see answered with our patients is if you have a patient who passes the stump in the screening trial, but is agitated for that patient to see if we're excited or not. And, and the problem with this study is that that's, it asks that question just for precedence. And so, right. The answer that you got is giving Presidex is better than not, but maybe if we use a different set of other than Presidex, we have a good response too. We don't know that. Sure. And people are doing these therapeutic studies. Are up to this point, we've said people should not be on sedatives if we're going to move them from the ventilator, right? Right. And these guys are saying, no, if we give them Presidex during that cleaning period, right. they do better if they're, if they're agitated. And so, um, I think there's a, a question here as to whether or not sedatives are good um, during that period or not in certain groups of patients, and I think that would be relevant. I think it's curious that they found no difference in adverse effects because right. that is not something that has been seen in before. Right. With this drug. And I think the cost is a thing on the table. So I think it's an interesting article, but mm -hmm. we should be very cautious about exactly how we can do this. Would you like have some hesitation to mm -hmm. in knowing that the study was under power? Because those missing things you know, would actually have more adverse effects. So the question you're asking is what do you do when you face with this patient? And I think the answer is that we don't really have sufficient data to inform us. Mm -hmm. Every one of us has patients in the ICU who get agitated when they're trying to take the patient off the ventilator. So what do you do? You may try first and get really agitated. So then you think, well, well maybe I should get better. <coughs> so I've had some patients where I reduce the versa and I keep the versa going from using extra data. And you have other patients where you try to press it and that seems to work. I've had patients where we've tried more, a couple of these trips to try to try to increase their their uh, baseline anti um, psychotic medicine, whether it's Seroquel, Algol, or something like that, to try to get through all dressing with this. And the problem is we don't have the data on what the best thing to do is. This helps a little bit, but mm -hmm. I don't think it answers no. the question entirely. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. One thing to do is I was having a hard time uh, concept, you know, conceptualizing <coughs> those patients who are using sexy comedy and the things that Blinded. Also, in addition, we see how there are other antipsychotics. Right. And maybe, you know, because it's not truly really placebo, because there's another thing on top treating the delirium. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, you know, the dose would be limited because you have another medication that's on top. And maybe what I'm trying to say is maybe he needs to come today to just get well a, a higher dose of therapy. Well, the brain don't know those. We don't know. And that's one of the things is that they don't specify the doses. Like you can see on this, the patients that were receiving antipsychotics, a quarter of them, in almost a quarter of them in both of the groups were receiving antipsychotics. So was it really the precedent? Yeah, being a quarter and only 74 patients makes me an easy to, you know, <laughs> Right. 50% of the 
talk to you over. <laughs> uh, just a couple questions and comments. We were actually part of me too. We actually did some roles because the difficulty in the depth of patients is you have the hypertension to focus on versus the depth of comedy. So we had so many patients that we had to exclude and withdraw because it's very difficult to manage patients like that. Right. So when you look at a trial like that, it's almost and that trial has been too been going on for about three years. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at what is this trial going to say, it will take four or five years to conduct it. <coughs> and then you have such a high exclusion rate because giving focal fall on the patient on legal fare is almost kind of crazy. You know, but <laughs> that's what literally we had to grapple with. And the other issue is that contaminate has anti inflammatory properties. Mm -hmm. And one thing, I don't know, did you talk about, I don't know if you mentioned it, but one of the things that led them down the road was severe septic and septic shock because they saw about a 15% mortality reduction in septic shock mm -hmm. specifically. We that to accommodate. So I think they're kind of teased out in that patient population, especially septic shock patients, whether it's a has dietary effects on the inflammatory response, and that subsequently has effects on mortality. Mm -hmm. And that's totally separate from the, you know, delirium. Right. Because mm -hmm. there's a mechanism of anti-inflammation. Mm -hmm. Right. So that hopefully that'll come out in the near future. But this will give you some idea of how difficult it is. I'm and sure. I mean, we literally try to blind focal ball versus that to comedy. I guess we'll pick up the bag and look. look. <laughs> 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 going to be ongoing. This is just continuing to add pieces and further questions to the puzzle and ultimately we don't really know what the best answer is. Hopefully with most of these studies we'll come to some sort of consensus but I think each study that comes out gives us maybe a little bit more more to think about and how to, to move forward. So, so how did you apply the results of this study to your, your practice? So this is a concern. So this study was done in New Zealand. And if you look here at the patient characteristics, it's not exactly the same as what we see here. So we see some pretty sick patients. I mean, their Apache scores, I mean, not to say that they're nothing, but they're relatively low compared to some of the things that we see. So... But I think the Apache score should be low because there are patients who are... Right, yeah, th and that's what they were looking at here. But, you know, just applicability to <coughs> when we get a patient better and they're a point where it's just delirium that's limiting them coming off of the vent, if they were that much sicker, I mean, we expect them to take longer and it might be more of a challenge to come off. So I don't know if this is 100% applicable to us. A good chunk of these patients were also surgical, and in theory you'd think, you know, if they're just coming in for a surgery then they should be liberated from a vent quicker if it's just an uncomplicated um, sort of a surgery. So whether yeah, this is... Not, not right. Quite a significant. Very significant. So whether, I mean, I don't know that we can apply this entirely. I know we do use it. We select which patients we think, let's give it a try. And ultimately that's, that's where we're left with this. It's just continuing to give us some suggestion that maybe it's giving that it's a good idea, but it continues to open the door with multiple other questions. So, like I said, hopefully with all these other trials that are coming out, maybe we'll come to some sort of consensus, but I don't know that we have the right answer right now. I knew this was going to spark lots of conversation. <laughs> okay.